or heaviness when uh, someone whom we have uh, loved and appreciated so much passes away, but we also realise that life doesn't go on forever in this old world. And to get away up pretty near to the 97 mark is really doing pretty good, isn't it? And to do so with uh, st still having intelligence and uh, being able to enjoy what uh, life you have and the experiences that you have with other people is, uh, is a bonus and uh, is a blessing, not just to that individual, but to uh, the friends and, and relatives alike. Uh, Auntie Lucy doesn't have too many relatives left. There's uh, a grandson and a granddaughter. Um, there really aren't too many relatives left. The grandson and granddaughter are to her husband's first marriage. So they've been a little uh, um, separate. She has a cousin, I understand, who lives in town here, whom she saw from time to time. But uh, <coughs> she had a family that uh, was probably as significant to her as any other family could be, and that was her church family. And uh, I believe that's the way it is when we are united in the common bond of fellowship in Christianity. There's a family there that, as the scripture says, is closer than a brother. And so as a family, uh, we're sorry today, but we hold the hope in our heart uh, and the surety that the resurrection morning will see her grave opened and she'll be reunited with uh, those folk whom she's loved and associated with so long. Her funeral will be at 11 o'clock on Monday. It will be at uh, Morrison, Morrison Morris Funeral Parlour, uh, which is up on Carmo Road. And uh, most of you will know where that is. Um, the whole service will be there. Um, there are reasons for that. And uh, the reasons uh, that uh, it is a cremation. They would like to have the whole lot sort of put uh, together. Morris and Morris are doing the catering for the refreshments afterwards, and it will just be sensible to keep it all together. The funeral parlour there has a, a very nice chapel, as most of you know, and uh, it will be a, a very nice place for the funeral. So uh, that's the arrangements, 11 o'clock on Monday. Before I had heard anything of this, of course, um, I had decided to preach on a subject that we don't preach on very often for some reason. We seem to take it for granted, and that's the subject of the resurrection. Resurrection for better or for worse. And, uh, of course, when this uh, event occurred, Lucy's passing, I suppose it fitted into the scene, uh, quite well, and you might have thought, well, I made a sudden change. Well, I didn't. Um, I'd already been planning this way. <coughs> um, <coughs> Let's take a, uh, a text from the scripture. Uh, John chapter 5. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John chapter 5. And uh, Jesus makes a rather surprising statement. At least it was surprising for the people of his day because there was a lot of ambiguity around the subject of the resurrection. And in case there's someone here today who's not familiar with the word resurrection, um, let me uh, clarify it for you. Some years ago, I was uh, doing some Bible studies with uh, a fellow, and uh, we were getting along pretty well, I thought. And uh, I said to him, today our study is on the subject of the resurrection and his face looked a little blank. And uh, so I started into the study with all my enthusiasm and so on, and I saw that he was getting more and more puzzled, and uh, I said, there's something I've said that you don't understand. Um, do I need to make myself clear on something? There's something that you're just not following me here. And he said, yeah, he said, what's this terrible word resurrection? He says, never heard of it in my life before. So he was a person who had never even heard of a resurrection. Didn't know what it was, had no idea what it meant. And so uh, I had to explain the resurrection. Uh, <clears throat> when we're talking about it in spiritual terms is that great event when the dead are raised to life again. When graves are open, when, uh, when ashes uh, <clears throat> come together, when 
the bodies of those who have lived before are reformed and rebuilt and uh, they do so at the command of Jesus Christ who in the first place created human beings from the dust of the earth and at the end of time will give people back their body and their life again. Well, let's look at our text. John uh, chapter 5, uh, verses uh, 28 and 29. And Jesus says, and he's been talking to some people who have quite a bit of ambivalence about this, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves will hear his voice. You see, Jesus had done some remarkable things. He had raised someone from the dead, and uh, that was the centurion's son and uh, nobleman's servant, I should say, and uh, he had healed uh, a person who had been ill and as good as dead and had laid beside the, uh, the pool of Bethesda hoping for a cure by some superstitious means and Jesus had done this but the people were questioning about who he was and how it was that when he was around things happened in such an unusual fashion things happened that had never happened before people were raised from the dead uh, people who were incurably ill were cured of their illnesses and uh, they thought this person is somewhat different from the usual. What's all about this? And Jesus says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves will hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Resurrection for better or for worse. Everyone at some stage of history of this world will be resurrected. That's good news, isn't it? That's good news. Jesus said it. Jesus said everyone will be resurrected. All that are in the graves will be raised to life again. But he makes a distinction between the good side of this experience and the bad side. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation or judgment or punishment. That word damnation doesn't quite mean what we, we, how we use it when, we, uh, when we're swearing. It has a slightly different connotation of judgment. In other words, to meet their judgment, to meet the penalty for their sins, to meet their just deserts, their just rewards. And so everyone is going to be resurrected. God is not going to leave everyone in the grave as if the job that he came to deal with is uh, going to be left half done. Jesus is going to complete the work of dealing with the sin problem. He's going to complete the work of dealing with the sin problem in those who love him and serve him and give them their reward of eternal life and he's going to complete the sin problem in those who have rejected him and do not love him and don't care a hoot about him. He's going to complete that as well. He's not going to leave the work of salvation and the work of eternity and the work of restoration of this world incomplete. There's going to be a finality about it. And those even who hate him will be resurrected to receive their just rewards. You see, the death that people die in this life is a death of circumstance. It's a death that we die because we are unable in our weak and enfeebled condition to maintain life any longer. That's the death that we die in this life. But the death that the wicked will die ultimately when they have been resurrected at some time in the future, uh, that, uh, that resurrection will lead them to a death which is called the second death in Revelation. And that second death is a death from which there is never again any resurrection. That is a death that is final. That is a death 
which is annihilation. That is a death which ultimately will leave even no memory of them in existence at all. And throughout eternity, the memory of the wicked will be erased. That's a resurrection we want to avoid, isn't it? That's one we want to avoid. Everybody likes to make a little name for themselves. And at every funeral service, there's always somebody saying something good about the deceased, isn't there? I've probably been to more funeral services than most people because I've conducted so many of them. In fact, they used to call me the dying pastor at one time because I had such a run of, uh, of funerals. And, uh, but I wasn't the cause of any of their deaths, I can assure you. But uh, I never heard anybody get up and, and say, this, this person is condemned, this person is going to hell, this person is going to be destroyed, their memory is going to be annihilated from, from all eternity. I've never heard anybody say that. I can have my personal feelings sometimes because of the life that some people have lived and because of the way they have expressed their attitude towards God and man might indicate to me that maybe this person will not have eternal life and they will not come up in the resurrection of the just. But nobody says that at the funeral service because somehow there is always some sort of a hope in our hearts that there will be some grace of some kind extended to this individual so that they will come up in the resurrection of the just. Somehow there will be at least a good memory of them down through the ages. Somehow in the genealogies that people keep of their families and whatever, they will enter that name with some sort of pride. Although I've seen a few genealogies where some names have been left out because they offended the family. But uh, they weren't forgotten because their space that the space that should have had their name in um, automatically brought memory of them. And so they couldn't really be annihilated from there. And so there's going to be a resurrection of the just and of the unjust. <coughs> but I'm more interested in the resurrection of the just and the faithful than I am in the resurrection of the unjust. Because I have no part to play in the destiny of the wicked. I have no part to play in that unless I am wicked. And then I have. I have only a part to play in my life as I want to serve the Lord and as I trust and have faith and confidence in Jesus as my saviour, I have a part to play in that. I have a say as to whether I'll maintain my faith in Jesus Christ as the saviour of myself. I have a part to play in whether I'll live my life in the way that Jesus would want me to live my life, a way that would represent him and in a way that would make me fit to take to eternity so that I wouldn't pollute the eternal abode that God has prepared for his people. I have a part to play in that. So I'm interested in the <coughs> resurrection of the just. Let's have a look at a few references. And I've got a fair number here. We won't get through all of them, I don't suppose. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And then we have uh, the books of Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. And chapter 4 and verse 14 is the verse that I want. And this is very significant here, for it says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. And uh, it goes without saying, uh, will bring with him in resurrection from the grave. This is what the subject matter is all about. You see, Paul is addressing the Thessalonians who have two big problems regarding the life after death. And uh, one of the things he is addressing is the fact that in Jesus Christ there is assurance of a resurrection. <clears throat> Let me read it again. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, if we have confidence in what all that means, even so those also which sleep in Jesus... In other words, they die with that understanding, with that hope, 
that Jesus' death and his resurrection is adequate to atone for our sins and to give us the assurance of life. Even <coughs> um, them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. God will bring them from the grave as he did bring Jesus from the grave and as he brought a many others from their graves at the time of Jesus' resurrection. The scripture tells us that there was a great earthquake when Jesus died and there was an earthquake at Jesus' resurrection and at that time many saints, it says, arose and came forth from the graves and went into Jerusalem as witnesses of the power of Christ over death the power of Christ to raise people from the dead. Nowhere do we find anywhere in scripture a place where the dead were raised without the influence of Jesus Christ being there. Go back to the Old Testament where it is a rare occurrence that anyone is raised from the dead. And you probably first of all think of Elisha and, uh, and uh, the, uh, the lady whose uh, child died and uh, there was a big uh, panic and a big rush to do something about it and they, uh, they got Elisha and, uh, and he came and as a representative of Jesus Christ he was used as the agent to bring this child to life again. But it was Jesus who was the active force in giving life to that child for it is only in Jesus that life is available. Jesus is the creator of humanity. It was Jesus who breathed into the nostrils of Adam the breath of life. It was Jesus who gave life to anything that ever lived. It was Jesus who gave life to people who were raised from the dead. Go over to the New Testament and you can look at the, uh, the nobleman's uh, servant. It was Jesus there who brought life to them. It was Jesus who was with the widow of Nain whose son was brought to life. It was Jesus in every instant where his influence was. And then you come to the time when the disciples were occasionally um, put in a position where they were to raise someone from the dead. It was Jesus. It was in the name of Jesus. It was by the authority of Jesus. No resurrection has ever taken place, nor will ever take place, unless it is so under the authority of Jesus Christ. Why? Because God has given Jesus the authority of life. Jesus has the keys to life. For Jesus says, I have the key of Hades and of death, the grave and of death. And uh, read about it in Revelation. Let's take a look in, uh, in John chapter 10 and verse 17 because uh, these words come from Jesus himself. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Chapter 10, and uh, verse 17. <clears throat> and here we read, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Now this word power is an interesting word. Power doesn't necessarily mean an enormous amount of energy. Jesus is not saying I have so much energy inside me that you can't kill me off. That's not what he's saying. This word power is more in relation to authority. I have authority. In other words, God the Father has given me authority here and uh, nobody can take my life from me until it is the right time to lay it down. Jesus is talking about, of course, what will happen at his crucifixion and so on. No, <clears throat> therefore doth my Father love me because I lay down my life and I take it up again. Jesus is talking about giving himself as the sacrifice to pay for the sins of humanity. That he would take the responsibility of our sins, he would die for them, and uh, uh, he says, uh, my father loves me because of this. We are together in this. No man takes it from me, Jesus said. Nobody takes my life. I lay it down of myself. I have the authority, I have the power, 
I, I have all that it takes to lay down my life and I have the power and authority to take it up again. Another reference is that Jesus uh, rose from the dead from the power that was within himself. No resurrection ever takes place without that power and authority of Jesus authorizing it. And no matter what sort of stories you might hear that might come out of all kinds of even religious circles that suggest that people have the power to raise the dead, you can discount it as being false and being a deception. There are some great stories going around at the moment, um, some of them coming from South America, where people are said to have the power to raise others from the dead. And uh, be, be cautious of these stories. I believe that God can use agents as he used the apostles as his agents. Jesus can use them to raise people from the dead. But uh, look at the circumstances and you might find that some of these stories are actually apocryphal when they come out of a modern day setting. I'm not discounting that it cannot happen. What I'm saying is there's a lot of fantastic stories going around today that attribute what belongs to God or to Jesus Christ to human beings. And there are some things that God has not given to human beings, and that is he has not given human beings the power of life. And he never will. <clears throat> and so Jesus is the one. You see, the resurrection, because of its universality, affects you and me, whether we like it or whether we don't. Because of the universal value of the death of Jesus, where he gave his life for us voluntarily and where he took it up again voluntarily, incorporates all of us. It makes no difference whether you are the thief on the cross on the left of Jesus or whether you're a thief on the cross on the right of Jesus. One who accepted him and one who rejected him. The two opposite, it makes no difference because the death of Jesus was adequate for both. And the resurrection power that Jesus has is adequate for any circumstance, but it is always at the discretion of Jesus. Jesus decides who will be raised for eternal life, and Jesus decides who will be raised to receive the punishment of sin that they have not handed over to Jesus Christ. Jesus says, all judgment has been given to me. Jesus is the one. You see, <clears throat> there are those who will be raised to life and will face the life giver, and there are those who will be raised to life who will fear the life giver. Let's have a look in Revelation uh, 20. And uh, we'll use verse 4 and verse 6, I think it is. Revelation 20, last book in the Bible. And it's uh, usually harder to find because you've usually got a lot of paper stuff beyond there. But you'll find it, Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And it says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. This is those who have been saved for God's kingdom. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, that's a whole other story, we won't talk about that today, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, that's another subject, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now this term, one thousand years, is generally meant or understood to be taken literally that for 1,000 years those who have been resurrected on this world are taken to heaven and they are with Christ, they reign with him, it says. In other words, they share in Christ's victory. They, uh, they're not there as little lords and kings ruling it over everybody else. They're not there to learn how to be rulers down on this earth so that they can rule uh, different nations or culture groups. That's not what it's about. They are <coughs> in heaven, uh, reigning with Christ, they are sharing in Christ's victory. And what's the victory that they're sharing in with Christ? The victory of life. 
the victory that comes with resurrection. They are sharing the victory over death. And they are living, they are living life to the full. Whatever life to the full is in heaven, it's got to be better than here. And they are living life to the full in heaven, sharing in the great victory over death. After all, they wouldn't be there if there was no victory over death. But there's a little but here. Well, let me say, these are those who are facing the life giver and can face the life giver with cheerfulness and, and, uh, and with excitement and with, with peace of heart and with thankfulness and gratitude. But verse 5 tells us something else. But the rest of the dead, the rest of the dead, those who were not resurrected at this moment, did not live again until the 1,000 years were finished. They didn't live. The rest of the dead had to wait for a 1,000 years. You see, God's people get the first go at heaven. Those who have been faithful to the Lord and those who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, they get 1,000 years of life, at least on the face of it, more than those who don't. In actual fact, of course, they get their eternal life when Jesus comes. And they have a thousand years there, but the wicked wait for a thousand years. And at the end of that thousand years, <coughs> they <coughs> are resurrected to receive their reward. Verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. And then it goes on to describe what happens to those who are not raised in that first resurrection. They still maintain an opposition to God. Yes, Jesus raises them up. A thousand years behind us, we hope, for we want to be in the first resurrection. He raises them up to receive their just reward. It's short-lived. They don't live for very long. We don't know how long. The scripture doesn't give any indication of how long it takes for these people to be raised from the dead, which would probably be an instantaneously, but for how long it takes for them to express their opposition to God, we're not told. Comparatively short time, I take it, but they express still their opposition to God and God has no alternative but to destroy them because they would destroy God's paradise if they were allowed to live on. Their just rewards are meted out. The righteous live with God because they have committed themselves into his care and keeping. They have committed themselves to the authority of Jesus Christ who has the power of life. And they have submitted themselves to him willingly because they recognize that in Jesus Christ there alone, in the principles of his life, the principles of his teachings alone can be found that which can be maintained throughout eternity. The principles of those who reject God and the principles of God's kingdom, for they have some principles that they base their life upon and their thinking upon, will be seen to only end in destruction. For the principle that they have worked upon is the principle of selfishness. And the unsaved, no matter what else they have done, all kinds of wickedness or all kinds of little sins, whichever it might be, the big sins that we call big sins and the little sins, and those change according to cultures and according to um, uh, different eras, of course, whether they be big sins or little sins, when it's all boiled down and all condensed, it comes down to one word, and that's selfishness. They have wanted to live for self. They didn't want an authority over them. They wanted to be their own authority. We start pretty young with that, don't we? We start pretty young. 
probably at about three weeks old, four weeks old, when mum goes to change the nappy. If you're American, it's diaper, isn't it? But we call it a nappy. Treasure it is nowadays, isn't it? That's a better word. Mum goes to change the treasure and the baby kicks up and objects because the baby doesn't want that horrible thing wrapped around it again anymore. I'm surprised that our kids don't walk around all bow-legged with those huge nappies they used to put on kids. But uh, they don't want it anymore. And soon the baby is starting to demonstrate its self-will. You see, we have a problem. We are born with a problem of self-centeredness. We've inherited it from Adam and Eve. Selfishness. Cain demonstrated it. Talked a little bit about it in our Sabbath school class this morning. We've inherited a problem of selfishness. And that self, that self that we so like to promote has to be subdued because selfishness leads to death. There is no future for those who insist that self should be the only authority in their lives. We need to recognize that we must submit to the alternative, which is Jesus' philosophy of love. And love is exactly the opposite. It is selflessness. Selfishness and selflessness are the two opposites. They are the two poles apart. And those who are resurrected in the first resurrection are those who have decided for selflessness and those who are resurrected in the second resurrection are those who have decided for selfishness. And that's as simple as that. That's what it boils down to. So the resurrection of everyone will ultimately mark the decision that they have made in their life and in their experience. Whether they've lived for self or whether they have lived in love for their fellow men and for the Lord Jesus Christ and his Father God himself. Resurrection is only possible by divine activity. There's no other way that one can be raised to life. They tell me that uh, on the outskirts of New York there is a big warehouse there and it has 2,300 deep freezers in it. It's a rather interesting warehouse. The deep freezers are set at minus 80 degrees and in each one of those deep freezers is someone who considered themselves famous or at least worthy to be part of a new life. They didn't want to be buried, they didn't want to be cremated, they didn't want their body to decay, so when they died, they left in their will, plus enough money to keep them there for who knows how long, uh, that they could be put into ice and frozen in the deep freezers. Well, of course, you've all read those horror stories and, and so on, probably seen some movies even, uh, <coughs> that you may not, <coughs> should not have seen perhaps, <coughs> of people who've committed murder. <coughs> and to cover their crime, they've put someone in the fridge of the deep freezer. Well, these deep freezers are a bit better than those amateur jobs, and these people are in these deep freezers. They want to be the first to be offered the new found, they hope, newly discovered, <coughs> newly discovered uh, science that will give them their life back again. Um, two of them that I've read about um, said that in the year 2000, they were to be taken out and experimented upon to see if they could restore them again. And uh, there was some excitement because they thought they had thawed them out and that their flesh and their tissue had not decayed significantly. It was just a matter of getting some breath into them again, get them breathing, and away they'd go again. But it didn't work too good because after two or three days their tissue decayed and you know what happens after that. There are people who are hoping that some magic will turn up somewhere along the line so that they can have life again. There are others, of course, who are more pragmatic and they realise if we're going to be given another body and to get us together, it's going to be pretty difficult. What happens to someone who has been cremated and uh, a large part of their body has gone up in gases into the atmosphere and spread from here to Australia or South America? Now that, of course, would be very hard to get together again. Others, of course, don't seem quite so bad. They've been put in a casket, a lead casket like they used to have years ago, 
Pity help the pallbearers because they had some heavy people in heavy lead caskets. It was a pretty tough job. But uh, <coughs> they, uh, they put them in there. And uh, they perhaps wouldn't be too hard. But then I've been to some of these old graveyards and uh, I've seen some of these enormous tombstones <coughs> they put in some of these old graveyards around <coughs> early 1800s. The tombstones are enormous. And the amount of uh, concrete or stonework on top of the graves, you wonder if they ever believed in the resurrection. They were intent on holding them down no matter what. But uh, God can deal with that. But uh, we have these vain hopes. This ridiculous idea circular around, lading around in, in high circles in the world that someday something good will happen and life will be granted again to those who have gone before, especially those people who seemed in our thinking to be significant, great scientific leaders, great military leaders, great uh, governmental leaders, uh, mil uh, political leaders and so on. The scripture tells us there will be no resurrection unless it's done by Jesus Christ. Divine activity alone will raise the dead. There is no alternative. <clears throat> Let's have a look in Revelation. We are there, but we need to go right to the start of Revelation. Chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. So you'll have to go back about 12 pages, probably, something like that. Chapter 1, verse uh, 17 and 18. <clears throat> and uh, this is just the introductory stuff to the book of Revelation. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he, s he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. Now, this is obviously Jesus who has uh, come to John and Jesus and John were on pretty good terms and Jesus, uh, John hadn't seen Jesus uh, for some while, evidently, for Jesus had gone back to heaven. But he comes and makes his appearance to John. And he says to John, fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys... That I isn't in there, is it? But it's inferred in Greek. I'm alive forevermore. And you can put I in there quite legitimately. I have the keys of hell and of death. I have the keys of the grave and of death. For hell here is simply the grave. Only divine activity will raise the dead. At the call of Jesus, the dead arise there is no other way to be sure of a resurrection than to be on the best of terms with Jesus if the only way that you could obtain enormous riches was perhaps to go and clean the house for some multi-billionaire and he assured you that he would leave you upon his death a fortune, would it be too hard to go and clean his house once a week? Especially if he was about 85 or 90 years old and had all the common diseases that people have these days. Wouldn't it be too hard to go and clean his house every week, would it? If you knew you were going to inherit from him an enormous fortune just by doing him that favour. It wouldn't be too hard. And yet sometimes we find it too hard to offer a service to the Lord Jesus Christ. The service of giving up our own selves to him. Committing our own selves to him so that we might be able to enjoy the experience of the resurrection and eternal life. We have our values all wrong, don't we? Sometimes we let selfishness, we let self get in the way of the potential for the best thing that could ever happen in our experience in a whole eternity, and that's the resurrection. The disciples were thrilled about the resurrection. None of them saw it. None of them actually saw Jesus leave the tomb in the first instance, but they experienced in their life and ministry for Jesus what it was to raise people to life. They saw those who had been raised when Jesus was raised from the grave and they knew that it was real. 
And they gave their hearts and their lives to Jesus Christ. They gave their thoughts, they gave their mental powers to Jesus, they gave their physical strength to the work of promoting Jesus Christ and his philosophy of life. <coughs> and uh, they knew that they were in for a great reward. The Apostle Paul said, I've lived a good life, I have done what I ought to do, from now on I know there is a crown of righteousness laid up for me. He was talking about after the resurrection. There is a reward. The resurrection of the just is the reward for those who will give up self and give themselves over to the Lord Jesus Christ. Pretty good deal, don't you think? A pretty good deal. I'm not telling you that it's easy to do. I'm telling you that it can be done. I'm telling you that it must be done if you want to have part in the resurrection of the just and have eternal life. You can do it. You can do it by giving your heart, your mind, the old term heart simply means your emotion, your, your, your mind, over to the Lord Jesus Christ and let him control your principles of living. Because the, the attitude that you take to life today may well decide the attitude that God has to take to you at the end of time. When he's sorting out who's going to be in that first resurrection and who unfortunately has to be in the second. Shall we uh, take our hymnals? If you're using hymnal, it's uh, number 442. And let's sing together uh, our final hymn. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today that you have given us the assurance that this life need only be temporary and only the uh, forerunner to an eternal life where we'll be free from the things that hinder us so much here in this world, the things that are hateful and hurtful and painful. We pray that uh, you will accept our dedication to you today as you've promised to do. We pray that uh, we will accept your grace. We pray that we'll accept what you have done for us and that we might have the assurance in our hearts that we will rise in that first resurrection and receive the immortality that you have promised to us. Make, and we pray that this will be to each one of us a hope, an assurance and a comfort. Keep us faithful till Jesus returns, we ask please in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>